So for those of you that don't know, uh, my name's Matt Anderson. I'm the curator of history here at the Sioux City Public Museum. Uh, and so we thought since uh, the, the Grapes of Wrath was the book for uh, this spring's One Book, One Siouxland, uh, that it'd be a good idea to do a, a survey of, uh, of Sioux City during the, the Depression era. Uh, Sioux City's experience, I think, is pretty emblematic of what it, probably maybe the majority of people experienced during the, uh, uh, the, the Depression years. Uh, it not, not as severe overall as, for instance, the Joad family and the people from Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma in particular, experienced during those years, uh, but but uh, trying nonetheless, and uh, and also a lot of the uh, things that were characteristic, like the public works projects and things like that, uh, were, were very much uh, happening here in Sioux City. So uh, let's go ahead and get uh, get started. First off, with a, a little overview of what Sioux City was like uh, on the eve of the Great Depression in the late 1920s. So let's let's look at a few images of Sioux, of the Sioux City area in in 1929 or so. First off, as, as most of you know. Uh, Sioux City's economy was really uh, centered around the, the, the livestock uh, meatpacking industry and the livestock marketing. Uh, and so you had the, uh, the by, by the 1920s, the Sioux City stockyards were, uh, uh, were a huge enterprise. Uh, and they, they stretched all along the, the lower reaches of the Floyd River, between the Floyd River and the uh, Missouri River. Uh, and then by this point, uh, there were three big uh, Chicago-based packing companies, uh, Armour and Company here, Cudahy and Company here, and then Swift and Company at, at the northern end. And uh, you know, this was a, a time when uh, over four million head of livestock, uh, mostly cows and, and hogs, uh, would come through uh, the Sioux City stockyards, and uh, thousands of people were employed in this industry. And so that, that, that had been a bedrock of, of Sioux City's uh, uh, um, economy since, since the late 18th 80s or so. Here, here's another overview. This is what the uh, the Sioux City or the uh, Stockyards Cattle Division would have looked like at this time. Uh, you have the open cattle pens here. Off to uh, off to your your right is the the old uh, Stockyards Exchange Building where the commission firms and the Stockyards Company itself uh, was headquartered. And these are our unloading chutes for the rail cars to to uh, to uh, unload uh, hogs and, and cattle. Uh, in, well, it had been cattle in this area uh, into into the Stockyards pens themselves. Uh, by this this point, uh, a lot of livestock was also trucked into into the stockyard, so uh, you had a you had big railroad and trucking facilities. Of course, as it is today, Sioux City was a major uh, grain marketing center as well, and so uh, several of these facilities are are, are still in operation in some uh, form. Uh, International Milling Company that was out in in, the, in Leeds, uh, and there, there's still a portion of that uh, uh, between 41st Street and Highway 75. Uh, of course, Terminal Grain Corporation is is Arthur Daniel Midlands uh, today, out on Highway 75 at uh, at 11th Street or well 14th Street, uh, and then. Uh, at Flanley was is actually part of the ADM uh, facilities out in that area as well. Uh, there was another sec uh, another uh, branch of international milling right downtown uh, over on at Third and Water Streets on the over in the area where the Hard Rock Casino is today. Uh, and then you had the Western Terminal Elevator Company, uh, which that that uh, that still exists. It's just to the north of the uh, Gordon Drive Viaduct, about halfway across. You can still uh, see that structure. Uh, so so there were there were uh, you know the major uh, corn and uh, raising area, and uh, and th th this was a very active part of of what was going on in Sioux City as well. Of course, a lot of quite a bit of heavy industry in Sioux City had been built up in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, one of the prominent industries would have been Albertson and Company, or better known as Sioux Tools, uh, out on Floyd Boulevard. Uh, it had gotten its start in the 19 teens, uh, right before World War One, uh, and had grown into a very large enterprise uh, by the mid 1920s when this photograph was taken. Of course, they were famous for making a whole line of the Sioux brand tools. Uh, they also made things like uh, uh, valve grinders for automobile uh, mechanics and, and things like that. Uh, the other thing Sioux City was really known for was the was the wholesaling business in general and, and grocery wholesaling in, in particular. And so Third Street downtown was literally all warehouses almost along the whole length and uh, to the south of Third Street uh, were, were railroad switchyards and so uh, goods were shipped into Sioux City and, and uh, loaded into these warehouses and then either shipped out on other cars or by truck into the surrounding area. 
And of course, the railroad industry itself, Sioux City was, had developed into one of the larger terminal railroad uh, centers in the, in the United States by the 1920s. I believe it was in the top 10 uh, by that point, uh, both in terms of freight and it, it passenger rail service was still a, a major thing in, in, uh, uh, in Sioux City at that time, too. So here we have a picture of a Chicago and Northwestern uh, train. We're looking to the uh, back to the east uh, from, uh, well, around 2nd Street, 2nd Court Street. And here's just a downtown, it's a little bit blurry, but the, a downtown uh, view of what downtown Sioux City would have looked like uh, around 1928, just showing, you can see the lines of, of warehouses on 3rd Street, these big structures here, and then the railroad yards uh, to the south of those. Now, of course, also, Sioux City, the Sioux City region is a major agricultural uh, area, had developed into uh, one of the more important agricultural regions in, in the United States. Uh, and Going into the 1920s, uh, the United States really was just getting out of the, the really the best period, best most, the most prolonged period of, of uh, prosperity in American agricultural history between 1900 and 1920. Uh, that's oftentimes called the golden era of American agriculture. It was a period where, uh, really, for the first time, there was a steady rise in the, in the, the value of agricultural commodities, uh, and, it, and it culminated during the World War I year, years, between 1914 and 1918, uh, when, when commodity prices skyrocketed because over in Europe, as the war raged, European agriculture was basically taken offline and U.S. farmers filled the breach uh, and, and did very well overall. And you can see it in, in this picture from uh, the early 1920s. This is the uh, Bachman farm uh, out by Holstein in, in 1924. Uh, and during that period in the late 19-teens, a lot of area farmers bought new, new land. They expanded their operations. They built new facilities like the, this uh, vertical silo that you see here. Uh, they, they, for instance, the Bachmans were raising uh, uh, purebred uh, Scottish cattle, I believe, Scottish shorthorns. Uh, so they, they got into a more expensive breed of, of cattle. Uh, they bought things like, uh, you know, new equipment like tractors and uh, reaper binders and things like that. Uh, and of course, all of that cost money, and they did that with the expectation that agricultural commodities would keep going up in value. Uh, and, uh, and, and Unfortunately, that, that isn't really what happened, and it helped set the stage for some of the problems, especially in the early years of the Great Depression. Uh, here we have a picture of example of the new kinds of equipment that were available in the 1920s. You have a McCormick Deering uh, tractor, uh, and it's pulling a, a, a Reaper binder. So this is, a, you know, first off, a gas-powered tractor uh, that, that could pull then a mechanical Reaper binder that both cut, they're, they're harvesting oats in this case, but it could cut the oats and then bind it into a, into a bundle all in one. That used to be two different steps in the process, and this was a machine that could do that all at once, and it greatly increased the efficiency. Uh, around this time, the combine uh, reaper binder harvester was also brought online, which we still use to this day, uh, and made things even more efficient. So that, that kind of thing, technology was really making a difference in agriculture and boosting production, uh, but it didn't help with uh, individual farm prices, as, as we'll see. So here's something I, I want to point. It's gonna be. I'm gonna read a couple of these because uh, it's gonna be hard. I can see it's gonna be hard for people here to see. But I think I think we need a few figures to put this in perspective. Here I have a a long range of the the, the average wage that the farm laborer, that's just the average farm laborer, would have made uh, between 1870 up until the end of the 1920s. And keep in mind, so the 1920s census was the first time in American history where more people were recorded as living in urban areas than in rural areas. But in, in Iowa, that it was things were quite a bit different. All, almost 60% of Iowans still lived in rural areas in, in 1920. Uh, and and that, that figure was pretty much was similar uh, in, in 1930. So in the 1920s, Iowa was still overwhelmingly rural. rural and a lot of the, the, the average laborers were day laborers. Uh, and oftentimes, they helped out on farms, particularly during uh, planting season and then during harvest in the fall. Uh, and so their, their wages are uh, in, at, in this period are, are pretty indicative of what the average worker, you know, the average unskilled worker would have been making in America uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so you can see in 1869, 
the, the average farm laborer made 87 cents per day, so it's even less than the old dollar per day that uh, uh, is often talked about in old songs and stuff like that. Uh, and you can see it, that that didn't go up much over the course of the, 19, the end of the 19th century. In, 19, in, uh, in 1899, it was still just, it was 99 cents a day, so there hadn't been much movement there in, in 30 years. Uh, now, it did start to go up in, in, in 1910, and a lot of that has to do with uh, increased demand overseas for American agricultural products. And also, America was growing big, you know, in a major way because of immigration, mostly from Europe. Uh, and so that was boosting demand for American agricultural products, and you see it reflected in farm uh, labor costs. So by 1910, the average uh, farm laborer was uh, making $1.40 uh, per day. Uh, and then it really peaked in 1920. So you can imagine during World War I, over, almost four million American, young American men went in the military and that constricted the uh, market for farm labor. Uh, and so correspondingly, uh, prices rose and they rose all the way to $3.56 per day in 1920. But then during the course of the 20s, they, they went down, they actually decreased. So the farm laborer wat, lost ground during uh, the 1920s. So in 1927, that had gone down to $2.46 to, uh, per day. And so what that shows you is, we think of the 1920s as a, as a prosperous period, and, and it was overall in the, in the United States, but in agriculture it wasn't. And, and so Sioux City did pretty well during the 20s, but because the, the agricultural sector kind of struggled, particularly in the early 1920s, uh, the, 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 Sioux, the Sioux City area wasn't doing that great on the eve of the Great Depression, and then things got a lot worse once the Depression set in. And then I also want to point out a few things about how farm commodity prices uh, uh, moved during the same period of time. Uh, and you, you can see it. So I have ho cattle, hogs, and corn going back to 1870. Uh, and cattle in 1870 were $22.84 per, uh, that, that's per head. So that's not per hundred weight. That's, that's for uh, on the hoof. Uh, and th it peaked in 1919 at $54.65. So that, that was a a pretty big rise. And then in the early 1920s, there was a sharp drop off. Uh, prices just collapsed in the early 20s. A lot of farmers went broke between 1920 and 1922 or so uh, because they couldn't make the, couldn't pay the debts that they had incurred there during the World War I era. Uh, and so in, in 1922, you could see uh, cattle prices dropped to uh, $30.39 from 54 65 and then it got, you can see in the early years of the Great Depression, it was way worse yet. In 1934, they bottomed out at $17.78 per head, where they had been uh, almost $55 per head in, in 1919. Uh, it, hogs are really even more extreme. So they peaked at $22 uh, in, in 1919, dropped, dra you know, dropped pretty, uh, pretty dramatically uh, to, to under $11 in 1922, and this then just completely collapsed in uh, 1934 to $4.09 a head. I'm pretty sure in, in 1934, uh, pork was selling for, I, I, think, I think hogs were selling for 10 cents per hundredweight at, at one point. It was just a disastrous situation for, for farmers, and I think it explains some of, of the, the things that happened in the early 1930s in this area. Corn is even more volatile. It really was pretty stagnant all through the late 19th century at around 50 cents per bushel, and then it peaked at, in 1919 at $1.51 per bushel, which I believe in American history, if you adjust for inflation, is basically the highest it's ever been. Uh, then it, it dropped dramatically in 1920 to 64 cents, uh, and it kind of rose a, a little bit during the 20s, uh, and then it started coming down in 1930, and then just collapsed in 1932 to 32 cents a bushel, which is, again was, that, that was way below the cost of production. So it cost the farmer way more to, uh, uh, to feed his hogs and cattle uh, or to grow the corn uh, than it did to, than what he could get in, at, at the market. And of course, that's a, uh, if you're in debt, that's, that's a really disastrous situation. All right, so in the early 1930s, the first thing to happen after, so you had the Wall Street crash in 1929, and it took some months for it to become the Great Depression because not all stock market crashes uh, to have turned into depressions in, in American history, uh, but this one turned into a really bad one, and there are, we, we won't get into all the reasons for it, but uh, uh, World War I was, had a lot to do with it, and then uh, weakness in an important sector like agriculture is, is another reason, and so, uh, 
1932, 1933, there was a wave of unrest in the rural areas in Iowa, and it was particularly bad in the Sioux City area. Uh, there, was a, there was an organization formed called the Farmer's Holiday Movement, led by Miles Reno. Uh, and the idea behind the Farmer's Holiday Movement was to try to limit the supply of, of agricultural products coming to market to raise prices at least back to a parity level where you could break even uh, when you sold your uh, commodities at market. Uh, and so they, they tried all kinds of things to do that. And what they really were trying to do is discourage farmers from bringing their, their uh, uh, livestock and their, their grain and their milk and things like that to market at all. Uh, and so here we have an example of what, the, what they're doing is they're collecting milk that's come into uh, the, the Sioux City area, and they're just going to give it away to, to people that uh, can't, can't buy their groceries rather than sell it to the local creameries at a loss. Uh, and so that's what they're doing in, in this picture. And this is in August of 1932. Now, around that time was a, a famous event uh, called the Sioux City Milk War. Uh, here's another group. This is a, a band of farmers holiday people outside the north entrance to the Woodbury County Courthouse, and you're looking to the north. And you can see this would be pretty intimidating, a group of farmers outside the, uh, the, the, the local uh, governmental facilities. Across the street, you see that's the, uh, the old Iowa Telephone Company building, I believe, on the north side of the street where the Woodbury County Jail is today. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, so people, so at this point, uh, a lot of farmers were, were losing their farms. If they were in debt, they couldn't make their uh, payments back to the bank. And of course, that became disastrous for the banks as well because uh, with, when, when commodity prices collapsed, uh, the value of farmland collapsed as well. And so if the bank had, ta had the, uh, the land uh, as collateral for whatever loans that had been taken out, uh, they couldn't possibly recoup their loan either. And so a lot of pressure was put on especially small, smaller rural banks. Uh, and so it was, it was just a, a terrible all-around situation. Now here's a, a good example of, of uh, what would happen oftentimes. The, the farmer's holiday movement would set up blockades outside of a big marketing center like Sioux City. So they, on all the major roads coming into town, like Highway, you know, Correctionville Road and out on Military Road to the west, uh, they, they would actually blockade the, the roads and then they would... Uh, with, with some degree of physical intimidation, try to get the, uh, whoever, the farmers that were coming to town to not bring their cattle to, or hogs to the uh, stockyards or to not have their, uh, bring their milk to the local creameries, whatever they had to do to uh, try to get them to not add that to the glut of, of agricultural products. And so here we have an example of that kind of blockade. Uh, and there was an event called the Sioux City Milk War in, in 1932 where barricades were put up around Sioux City and, and literally these groups of guys from the uh, Farmer's Holiday Movement would stop the trucks coming into town and force the drivers to just dump the milk into, into the, into the uh, uh, ditch. And, of course, a lot of you know a lot of times the farmer didn't take that light a lot lying down, and there were fights and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, you know just un unruly unruly behavior. Now another thing that would happen uh, is so uh, when when uh, when banks would foreclose on on farmers who uh, could no longer pay the back their debts uh, as they were trying to sell off the land and the in the the property, oftentimes the uh, the the neighbors would get together and bid extremely low, especially for the equipment. So say like bid a, a penny for, uh, for, for the guy's tractor and then turn around and, and uh, give it back to him afterwards. Because, and that way the bank wouldn't get back any of, of uh, what they were owed. And they were called penny auctions. And this also uh, could led oftentimes to some violent behavior. So you can see in this photo, there are actually National Guard troops here by the barn uh, kind of standing and just watching in case uh, you know something something bad would happen. Uh, here's a, one of the more violent events that happened. So in this case, uh, this R.D. Markle uh, from, was coming into town uh, f f from South Dakota in, on Military Road, and he was stopped in in Riverside by the Farmers Holiday Movement, and there was actually gunfire broke out, uh, and and people were injured, uh, and so you can see the bullet holes in in his uh, in his truck. Uh, and here's a, a late example. This is a so in, in at the end of 1933, uh, the the Woodbury County Sheriff actually was organizing caravans to bring livestock to the stockyards from outside of town, and so the the sheriff's department was escorting uh, these livestock trucks into town so that they could get through the picketers uh, to to market. Uh, and this all this this unrest kind of came to a head uh, in in uh, late 1933 when up in Lamar's uh, a group of, of disgruntled farmers. Uh, 
kidnapped a, a judge uh, in that area that had uh, presided over many what they felt were an unreasonable number of forecl farm foreclosures. Uh, he was tarred and feathered, and they were he was nearly hung. Uh, he was not he was not killed, but uh, it was bad enough that the uh, the governor of Iowa at the time declared martial law in Plymouth County, uh, and it was it was just a really terrible time that way. Now uh, things did start to calm down after that because that particular incident seemed to turn public opinion against the, the farmer's holiday movement and that kind of overt violence kind of died down then after late 1933. Now, the other thing that happened here in Sioux City itself were, were bank uh, failings and this was more common in, in, the, in the smaller towns where the, uh, uh, where the banks were heavily invested in farm, you know, in farm land and in farm equipment and so when the farmers uh, were, were doing badly, eventually the banks were doing badly as well as, as those land values collapsed. Uh, but here we have an example of the Sioux National Bank uh, which was at 4th and Pierce Street, the southeast corner uh, and that had been in business since the 1880s, the early 1880s and it, uh, uh, it went broke in, in, uh, in 1930. And people were just kind of milling around outside. And keep in mind, at this point, uh, there was no federal deposit insurance uh, that wasn't put in place for another few years. And so if you had your, your money in the, in the uh, Sioux National Bank, uh, your, your, your whole savings could be gone, you know, whatever that, that happened to be. And there was no getting it back. It, was, it had just disappeared. So in that case, you would have literally been better off having your money under your mattress. Uh, and, and that's exactly uh, what happened in the system is people were, were start, you know, panicked and started withdrawing money from the system. And that just made things worse. So pretty quickly, you know, th those that uh, were in the, the, the uh, most difficult circumstances, uh, maybe had lost their job already and were having a hard time uh, feeding their families, uh, they, they, they were uh, in dire straits. And, and in the early 1930s, the, the local government, state government, and federal government really weren't mobilized to, to deal with the, the kinds of problems that uh, came on board. And so here we have a crowd of people outside what was called the Social Agencies Building. Uh, and this was over where the police and fire headquarters are today, over at the uh, northwest corner of 6th and Douglas Streets. I was right behind the, the, the building, uh, the rough cut stone building you see in the distance. That's the old uh, um, city hall at that time. And this, this building was right next to it, uh, right to the west of it. And so, you know, they're, they're looking for any help that they can get from, from local authorities and and they you know local authorities were hard pressed to to, to help these people uh, now during the 1930s there there was labor unrest the, the 30s really were the point when organized labor finally made uh, a real uh, headway in the United States and a lot of that was at uh, uh, the 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 in, with the encouragement of the uh, of the Roosevelt administration, when Franklin Roosevelt became uh, president, mostly with the idea of trying to boost purchasing power, because you know really what happened in the early years of the uh, 1930s, farmers of course lost their purchasing power because their commodities weren't worth anything, uh, and the average worker lost their purchasing power because so many people lost their job. You know, you had something like 25 percent unemployment or more nationally, uh, and so then that just seized up the system. There was there was it was hard to get get anything going after, after a certain point because uh, those that did have money were sitting on it and, and were scared that they were going to lose what they had and it, you know it was just it was a it was a stalemate that was hard to get out of and so uh, the, one of the ways that uh, the Roosevelt administration uh, looked to help this is was to try to boost industrial um, uh, wages uh, and, and they saw um, they saw unionization as a, as a way to uh, do that and of course in the in the meatpacking industry the meatpacking industry had been fighting the idea of unionization back way back into the 1880s at least uh, and and, uh, and it was finally in the 1930s that the the uh, the packing industry itself was was really thoroughly unionized, and there was a pretty severe strike at the Swinton Company plant in 1938. Uh, I haven't heard any uh, any incidents of anybody uh, being killed in that strike, uh, but uh, but it was a prolonged strike, and uh, you know already during difficult times. Uh, and so here we have some National Guard troops right outside the Swinton Company plant. Now the the main way that uh, the main way that uh, local government and state government initially and then eventually the federal government uh, tried to deal with the crisis uh, was through public works projects. 
Uh, and, it, and contrary to popular belief, uh, public works projects didn't begin with the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal. Uh, there, there actually were, were uh, a pr there was a pretty robust public works uh, program in, in, uh, in place already, even under Herbert Hoover. Uh, it was just expanded greatly uh, following Roosevelt's ascension to the presidency. Uh, and so a local example, so for instance, nationally, uh, Hoover Dam uh, had started already uh, in, in 19, well, already in the late 1920s, really, but it was going already before Roosevelt took office. Uh, and here in Sioux City, there was already a major uh, um, refurbishing of the local uh, school buildings going on uh, starting in the late 1920s and continuing throughout the 1930s. And so, for instance, in 1931, uh, Cooper School, Floyd School, and Everett School were all remodeled. These were all schools that had been built in the late 1800s. Uh, and they were uh, they were basically they, they, they it was called modernization. Flat roofs were put on them. Uh, all these schools you originally had to walk upstairs to get into on the first floor. They they made they took away the stairs and made entry into them uh, uh, from from ground level and, and and they did a number of things like that. And it, oftentimes additions were added were put on these buildings as well. Uh, other example, in 1932, Bryant, Longfell, and Hunt School uh, were all underwent uh, renovation. Uh, and many of these buildings were still, you know, have, are just now being replaced over the last 10 years and, and, uh, and most dated back to the late 1800s. Uh, the other thing that was going on already was uh, work on Perry Creek. Uh, during the 1920s, the Perry Creek uh, conduit was built downtown, where Perry Creek was actually put in a uh, in a culvert in the downtown through the downtown area. Uh, and this continued into the early 1930s. And so you see workmen uh, working on the Perry Creek Channel uh, up around uh, 13th and Main Street. Here we are, and so they're clearing trees and and widening the channel and things like that. Now at this point, most of this is uh, locally funded, uh, but but some like uh, for instance the uh, the school building also had some commitment from the from the federal government, just not as much as there eventually would be once uh, once Roosevelt took took office. Here's another example in 1932. This is up uh, by 38th Street uh, and just off of what today is Hamilton Boulevard. Uh, it's kind of right where the Casey's is now, up uh, 38th and Hamilton, uh, looking to the north, and that's the 38th Street Bridge across Perry Creek that's still there. Uh, and so you can see this is all trees today, but at that point they had cleared the trees away. And so they're trying to improve the, the Perry Creek was quite a flood problem uh, through Sioux City's history, and so the, it was it was seen as a way to to control flooding and to provide uh, jobs for unemployed workers. I uh, hear again. So this is in 1935. Uh, so by this point, uh, this is after Roosevelt had taken office, and there, the, the the work on Perry Creek was expanded a lot. And so this is under FARA, which is the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, and that was the main uh, early public works project uh, instituted under Roosevelt. Now here we have a picture from 1932, and uh, work is being done here at the, it'd be about 29th and Court Street, and this is in the area which would eventually become Leif Erickson Park. Uh, and so you can see already they're preparing the, that area to, to become the park. Uh, this is in the very early stages, so they're starting to grade down the hills. Uh, and, and that was basically a big undeveloped ravine is what it was. And so it was kind of wasteland that couldn't be sold for house lots. Uh, and the city decided to, to make a park out of it. And it was a way to uh, employ uh, local unemployed people. Uh, and so here's later. Uh, so this is in 1934, and so this is after uh, the, this was a New Deal uh, uh, organization called the Civil Works Administration that was uh, active during 1933 and 1934. And you can see they really uh, in, expanded on what had begun uh, under basically local funding in, in 1931-32, uh, and really the area that's becoming Leif Erikson is, is taking shape at this point. And that was, the, the park was finally dedicated in 1937, and, and it continued to be uh, developed uh, after that. Uh, so, for instance, in in uh, the early 1940s, the Lee Erickson Pool was was dedicated. Now, that was actually not a New Deal project. The the park itself was was partially a New Deal project, but the pool itself was uh, locally funded uh, by local government and then local donate local donations. Now, the biggest early uh, federal works project uh, instituted after Roosevelt took office uh, was work on what became 
Roberts Stadium and today Olson Stadium, Elwood Olson Stadium out by Morningside College. And again, that area was a, an unused ravine, an undeveloped ravine uh, that, that hadn't been uh, turned over to housing or developed by Morningside College. Uh, and so uh, at, at that point, the, the, school, the public school district had actually been looking to build an athletic field for East High because East High was up on Morningside Avenue and there was no space for an athletic field near the, the high school itself. Uh, and so this was going to be the public school stadium. Uh, and it was, it was seen, it was already a plan that was in place, but nothing had been done with it. And so the, the CWA, the Civil Works Administration, was instituted in the fall of 1933, and it just ran into uh, early 1934. And it was a, it was a real short uh, emergency stopgap because uh, the Roosevelt administration was afraid people were going to starve in the, the fall of 1933, or the winter of 1933-34. Uh, and so this was uh, put in place. Uh, now, keep in mind, uh, the, the, most of these New Deal projects, uh, once Roosevelt took office, were under the administration of Harry Hopkins. Uh, and Hopkins was born in Sioux City back in 1892. Uh, and so Sioux City has another connection that way because Hopkins was the main uh, um, New Deal administrator uh, for public works along with uh, Interior Secretary uh, uh, Harold Ickes. Uh, they were they were great rival rivals uh, all through the through the 1930s, but uh, but Hopkins uh, then later headed the uh, Works Progress Administration, which was the biggest of all the public works uh, groups. So this is a great picture in early 1933 of the uh, the the men reporting for uh, work out at uh, what became Robert Stadium, uh, and and so initially they were using trucks and and uh, uh, power equipment. Uh, eventually. The, uh, the uh, federal government said that not enough uh, people were being employed, uh, and so they actually brought in horses and mules uh, to do the grade work, uh, and, and guys just using shovels so that they could employ more people on this work, because they, they wanted to get a project done, but it was, it was actually seen as more important to provide jobs than it was to, uh, uh, to, to actually complete the project in a, in a short period of time. Uh, here's another, so this is early on when we have a bunch of trucks lined up, uh, hauling dirt into that area. And here's later, in 19, they were still working on it in 1936. By this time, the, the uh, Works Progress Administration had taken over. Uh, that, that was formed in 1935 and ran through the, less, um, the rest of the uh, Depression era. Uh, and so by this point, all the grading had been done for the stadium, and they were putting in things like uh, the sprinkler system and stuff like that for, uh, uh, for the, the new uh, athletic field. And here's a picture uh, during the uh, World War II era, about 1945, but this is what the whole complex looked like after it was completed. It was dedicated uh, finally in 1940. So it, it really was the one project that went on Pretty much through the, all the years of the depression was the uh, public stadium, uh, the public school stadium project. Of course, a lot more school remodeling went on after uh, after um, Roosevelt took office. So in 1934, Hawthorne School out in Leeds, uh, Franklin School over on uh, on uh, Highway 75, uh, and Smith School on the west side were all uh, remodeled. And these were using uh, Public Works Administration funds. And the Public uh, Works Administration was one of Harold Ickes' uh, projects under the interior, or uh, organizations under the Interior Department. And they mostly did things like uh, big projects like dam building and stuff like that. But, uh, but they did uh, provide funding for, for school remodeling and construction. Uh, here we have, in, in, uh, again, some more Lowell School uh, and, and Joy School were also remodeled during this period. The other thing that was done, so uh, the, the, not only was it looked, you know, for the most part, public works concentrated on high, uh, high labor type uh, activities like construction and things like that. Uh, but there, there were uh, unemployed writers, unemployed artists, uh, and, and they were oftentimes put to work uh, doing things in their, uh, in their chosen profession. And uh, one of the things that was done were, was the creation of murals at the local uh, high schools. And so these are the uh, CWA murals uh, at Central High School uh, done by Rollin Beard. Uh, in 1934, and so they depict early scenes in Sioux City history. Yep, th those still exist. And then at East High also uh, received uh, a set of murals, uh, these done by Herman O. Meyer, 
uh, at the same year. Again, Sioux City scenes. Now, here's just a picture of Hopkins School remodeled, uh, uh, another school that was remodeled in 1934. Oh, it, actually, Hopkins School was mostly rebuilt in 1934, uh, and then Bancroft School was uh, rebuilt in 1934. The earlier Bancroft School had burned a year or two before. And probably one of our, long, our, our longest lasting projects, something that's still used heavily today, was the uh, Grandview Park band shell. Uh, constructed in 1934 and 1935, uh, designed by the architect Henry Camp Fefner. Uh, and this was, this was, out, was an outgrowth of the local uh, American Legion Monaghan Post Band, uh, which was a world famous uh, uh, military band at the time, it had won several national competitions uh, and uh, uh, w was just one of the more uh, famous uh, orchestras in, in, or, or bands, military bands in, in, at the time. Uh, and they wanted a, a venue, they'd been hoping for a venue to play at throughout the 1920s. Uh, and it just so happened, ironically, during the 1930s when things were so difficult, uh, federal funding became available to construct the band shell in, in Grandview Park. Uh, and so this is a picture of it under construction. And just another view. And finally, when it was finished, uh, dedicated in May of 1935. And uh, of course, the Monaghan Post Band uh, developed after World War II into our municipal band, which still plays uh, uh, up at the band shell uh, during the summer months. Now, the other famous uh, New Deal organization was the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, uh, and the, the, the big CCC project during uh, here in Sioux City was the, uh, work in, in uh, Stone State Park. Uh, so Stone Park had actually de been developed as a city park uh, uh, starting in 1912, uh, but the city could no longer afford to run the park, uh, and in, in, by the 1930s and in 1935, they turned it over to the uh, state of Iowa, uh, and so that's why it's, it, today, to this day it's Stone State Park now. Uh, but here's a picture of the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, uh, encampment outside of Stone Park. So this was across what today is Highway 12 in the, in the farmland that's just outside of the main gate to Stone Park. Uh, and so the Civilian Conservation Corps was uh, focused on young men. So uh, men in their just graduated from high school in, between, say, 17 years old up into their early 20s. It had a very military-style uh, organization. They slept in barracks, as you can see here. They oftentimes wore or military style um, um, uh, clothing. Uh, they, they had kind of a military type discipline to it. Uh, and so instead of focusing on men with families and stuff like where, like a lot of the other uh, uh, project or organizations did, the CCC focused on young people. Uh, and so during the, the 1930s, this is one of the bigger uh, CCC uh, projects in the whole state of Iowa, they built all the main facilities in Stone Park. So the, uh, you have the uh, Rangers residence, and of course the, the Stone Lodge that uh, is still available to be rented for uh, events and things like that. And they did all the grading work for the most part for all the roads and trails and stuff that are out there. And so that was all uh, at least initially begun by the CCC. Uh, in the late 1930s, uh, the, the WPA also sent uh, workers out to help the, the CCC do some of the work. And so the, the men you see here, I think, are mostly WPA uh, guys because they look like older guys like me. <laughs> they, don't, they don't look like, uh, they don't look like uh, real young guys just out of high school. Yeah, here's another project that uh, the WPA did. So the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, uh, took over as the main relief organization or public works uh, organization in 1935. Uh, and here they, they, the workers are grading what is Macomb Avenue uh, out in, in uh, the very western part of Morningside. And you see that it, that is uh, um, Half Moon Lake right in front of it, uh, and, uh, w which is Pulaski Park today. Uh, and so they're, they're making Macomb Avenue gum all the way around and also uh, improving the road around Half Moon Lake. And here's just another view of that uh, so you get a kind of a better idea where it is. This is the Stockyards area in the distance. Uh, military Road, uh, which had been around since the earliest days of Sioux City's history, was uh, improved during the, uh, during the uh, 1930s. Uh, it was... It was 
you know, a really rough, uh, steep road, and they, they graded down some of, the, uh, uh, some of the inclines and things like that during the, the 1930s. So here's workers doing that, and they widened the road. And then the biggest uh, WPA project in, in Sioux City uh, was the first attempt to do flood control on the, on the Floyd River. So the, the Floyd River was Sioux City's biggest flood problem historically. Uh, at this point, it had already uh, flooded disastrously in 1892. Uh, it flooded in 1926, and it flooded in 1934 in kind of major ways. Uh, and so the, uh, the WPA had the idea to basically build a concrete line channel uh, from, uh, from what became the Gordon Drive Viaduct uh, down to the, the uh, junction with the Missouri River. And so here you have some initial grading work going on right down th in, the, in the stockyards district, because of course the, the, the packing industry and the stockyards were aligned right along the lower reaches of the Floyd River. Here we have a picture. This is up toward the northern end of the, the area uh, they were working on. This is, we're looking to the east, and this is where Floyd Cemetery is. Well, it was Floyd Cemetery then. So this would be the area where uh, things like Mark's Trucking uh, and uh, um, uh, Rasmussen in, in Engineering and things like that are in that area to the east of Highway 75, Lewis Boulevard. Now, this is a picture. So they're working on the, they're actually pouring the cement that's, that lines the channel, which you can still see uh, down in that area. Uh, and so during the, the winter months, they covered it uh, so that they could work inside during the harsh winter conditions. And so the, this is the uh, laying of concrete uh, at that point. Here's a picture of the men working down in the, in the muck. I like this picture because it shows, so you, you can see the concrete uh, uh, channel being built in the middle, and then you have the, um, the pilings that have been driven, and the, the river's literally flowing through these thin, narrow pilings uh, on either side of where they're pouring the concrete, so you can get an idea of how they uh, built that concrete channel. And they finally finished, so it started, work on that started in late 1935, uh, and it, they finally finished the concrete uh, lining in, in 1940. And so this is uh, uh, right toward the end of the project. Uh, and when it was finished, uh, there, there was a notion that uh, maybe that had fixed the, the Floyd River problem in Sioux City. Uh, unfortunately, that proved to not be the case in 1953 when Sioux City's worst Floyd River flood happened. Uh, but, uh, but that was the first uh, serious attempt to, to uh, do flood control on, on the Floyd River. As you can see in this picture, at that point, the, uh, what today is called the Gordon Drive Viaduct had already been uh, completed as well. And then we'll go right into that. So the Gordon Drive Viaduct at that time was called the Grand Avenue Viaduct. Uh, was, was constructed in, in the latter 1930s as well. Uh, construction began in 1936. So you can see the uh, piers being built here. And this was a combination of local city funds, state funds, and uh, uh, federal funds went into the viaduct. Just another, so in this case, we're on the far eastern end of it, looking back kind of to the southwest. Here they're, they're building the actual deck. As you can see, the viaduct was originally a two-lane uh, viaduct. Uh, today it's four lanes. That's because in the mid-1960s, um, the, the, I believe it's the south part of the, uh, the viaduct was, uh, was constructed to make it a four-lane. Uh, so the, it's, it's only the north part that dates back to the 1930s. And here they're finishing up the approaches. Uh, on the, this is on the east end, so the incline on the east end of, of the viaduct in 1937. Now, th th it was, this was a little bit of a political red herring in the late uh, 1930s because it, it cost quite a bit of, of local money. Uh, and at the time, the road where the viaduct ended and began weren't really well-developed roads at that time. And so th they hadn't, the state, uh, for instance, hadn't really made Highway 20 what became Highway 20 anyway, or what's Correctionville Road today, a uh, hookup uh, in this area from the east. And really what today is Gordon Drive wasn't the main avenue either in downtown. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so there were people who had been against the project, called it the bridge that started nowhere and ended nowhere. Uh, but, but obviously, eventually, it became a very important uh, artery for Sioux City and, and still is to this day, although I've heard that its days are numbered at this, at this point. 
I, now, a couple of uh, schools were built uh, brand new in the late 1930s. Uh, one was Hobson School, uh, and this was down in the South Bottoms area, uh, just to the southeast of downtown uh, at uh, Dace Avenue and, uh, and Floyd Boulevard. Here's a picture of it uh, uh, constructed, uh, and that was another PWA project. Uh, the other one was Webster School, uh, and which has been Lamb Theater for many years on the, on the near west side. Uh, that was also constructed in 1938-1939. So you, here you have that constructed. So there were uh, a couple of schools uh, built brand new in the late 1930s. And then th there was another mural uh, designed in, the, in, the, in 1939 in Smith School. So on, on, uh, at 16th and where Liberty School is today at 16th and Rebecca Streets. Uh, the, who's the artist? I can't remember. It's uh, Don, Don Glassell. And, uh, this one is really different from the earlier ones. Uh, the, the, this one reminds me of the, the, kind of those 1930s big murals that uh, guys like Diego Rivera and stuff did during that time. Uh, so it's a little more stylized. And, and it's, it's actually quite a bit bigger than this. I'm just uh, showing one panel. But it, it went on and shows that it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a heroic worker type uh, of, of image, the heroic farmers and industrial workers. Another well-known venue that was improved greatly was, uh, uh, was Hubbard Park uh, up at uh, 28th and Jones Streets. Uh, so Hubbard Park had been used as an athletic field for some time, uh, but in, in the late 1930s, the, uh, the actual cement uh, stadium was built during that time and new lighting was installed, and that was a, a WPA project. Uh, there, now, most, most WPA works programs were focused on men. Uh, at that time, men make, made up the bulk of the workforce. Uh, but uh, there, there was uh, the one project that was focused on uh, women that ran throughout the course of the, of the 1930s uh, was the county sewing room. And I, there were actually two of them. Uh, but this, the, the, the main one, though, was in the, uh, the, Woodbury, in the basement of the Woodbury County Courthouse. Uh, and this is a picture towards the end of the era in 1940. Uh, but that started in 1933, and they uh, they made clothes for uh, you know for for people that couldn't afford to buy them themselves. They uh, did special projects for uh, the the city and and uh, county, and uh, did all kinds of things. And the the other uh, project that had a real lasting impact was the construction of the Sioux City's municipal airport. Uh, at, at the time, in, in, at the beginning of the 1930s, the only airport in the Sioux City area was out in no, what became North Sioux City. It was called Stevens, South Dakota at that time, uh, in the area uh, that became Graham Field. Uh, that was Sioux City's first airport. Uh, but uh, in, in uh, the late 1930s, the WPA began the construction of the municipal airport. And so here's an aerial view down. So this is to the uh, west of Sergeant Bluff. Uh, and you can see the grading being done for the... Uh, for the the runways, and it, it it wasn't a big airport at all. It was it was a small thing, but uh, but an improvement over the facilities in North Sioux City. And so here's the uh, dedication of of the the new airport in in 1940, uh, and in fact the great uh, World War One flying ace uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, who had. Uh, um, Come actually come to, to fame in Sioux City back in uh, 1914 and 1915 when he won two big car races here in Sioux City. Uh, he came, at this time he was the president of Northeastern Airlines and he came to Sioux City for the dedication of the uh, airport in 1940. Now of course during the World War II the U.S. Army took over the uh, municipal airport and turned it into the uh, U.S. Army Air Base and trained thousands and thousands of uh, uh, mostly uh, B-17 bomber crews. Uh, it, they're also B-24s. Uh, and so it greatly enlarged the facility into more of what we think of it today. Another project that, uh, that started at the tail end of the 1930s uh, was the, the, the improvement of the, the, what would be the northern shore of, of the Missouri River uh, along the bluffs uh, to the west of downtown Sioux City that eventually held what was initially called River Road or Gordon Drive and then became the roadbed for Interstate 29 between uh, downtown Sioux City and out, and out to the Riverside area. And, and so it, keep in mind, originally the Missouri River came right up to the base of the bluffs through most of that area. And so the uh, 
the uh, WPA and the PWA and a number of different organizations uh, started work on reclaiming land, and so they drove pilings uh, into the into the river on, into the side of the river, and then raid, laid uh, mats along those pilings, and they then they they drew sand from the from uh, the the mouth of the Big Sioux River and started filling in land. So that's all man-made land that Interstate 29 runs on today, and, and this was linked uh, to the the Pick Sloan project that was going on with the damming of the Missouri River that had already begun uh, in the early 1930s. And so there was a long-range plan that eventually the Missouri River was going to be a much narrower channel once those, uh, uh, those dams were completed. And so this was seen as part of a long-range uh, part of that, that overall, uh, that overall uh, work that was done on the Missouri River during this time. So here you get an idea of what they're doing. So uh, you have you know, the barge out there driving the pilings. And then here you have the, their... They're pulling the, the sand out of the bottom of the Big Sioux River and piping it and dumping it on the other side of the pilings to make the new land. So I want to thank you for uh, taking your time. Thank you very much.